So now I'm going to hand you over to the lovely Sophie and she's going to discuss autism spectrum disorders uh, perinatally. Fantastic topic. Sophie is a second year student midwife an undergraduate master, she's studying for an undergraduate master's in science in midwifery with leadership at the University of Leicester in the UK. She's an autistic person and therefore very invested in ensuring accessibility and awareness for all autistic people. She is also a social media ambassador for the Student Midwife Journal and part of the Student Midwife Board of Elsevier. So over to you, Sophie, and I will give you presentation rights. Thank you. Mm. Just need to find you again. <laughs> oh, I forgot you. Yeah, all yours, Sophie. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, as we said, I am an autistic student midwife, so I'm especially interested in um, this topic and ensuring that we all learn about um, autism in the perinatal period. Obviously we've got people from all over the world so I just wanted to ask what comes to mind when you hear the word autism, how it's portrayed in your country, maybe in the media, whether that's positive or negative, if you know some more autistic um, and just jot some things down in the comments. <laughs> Different needs of communication and learning, yeah. Diverse, more positive portrayals recently than historically, that's very true. Coordination. Mm -hmm. Oh no. These are all really interesting things that I'm talking quite a lot about. Um, we're looking like a lot of the diversity of autism here. Um, and someone says a bit about um, being undiagnosed, especially in women, which I will get onto a lot. I'm just going to start. So this presentation is not inclusive of all autistic people. I cover some basics and I focus on people you're likely to see in maternity services. So that's autistic women. Um, and many you might not never, ever know that they're autistic or only learn from their notes. Uh, this is because they have learned to adapt to a neurotypical world, which is what we call masking. Um, there's often a debate over whether we should use the term autistic person or person with autism. Research shows that autistic people prefer identity first language, so autistic person, um, whilst parents and caregivers were more likely to use person first language, so person with autism. Um, in this presentation, I will be using autistic person um, as that is what the autistic community prefer. Um, the rationale behind this is generally that you cannot separate the person from the autism. It's not something that can be cured or changed um, but as with anything the best thing to do is to just ask people what they'd like to be called. Um, we refer to autistic people as neurodivergent. Um, this is someone whose brain functions, learns and processes information differently than others and includes people with ASD, so autism selection disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, dyslexia, dyspraxia, dyscalculia, dysgraphia and Tourette's syndrome. Um, and neurotypical is the opposite of this, so uh, people who do not have a neurodivergent condition. So here is a definition of autism from the National Autistic Society. Um, autism is a lifelong developmental disability which affects how people communicate and interact with the world. An estimated 1 in 100 people have ASD, with 700,000 being diagnosed in the UK. Defining autism is difficult and ever-changing and personally I would define autism as a neurological and developmental difference rather than disability, affecting people in a broad variety of ways. Autism can affect executive function, sensory processing and emotional regulation among others. 
some autistic people will consider it a disability and some will consider it a difference. For many, it is resulting in learning difficulties, mental health conditions and physical health problems um, that might make autism a disability. Some people also have difficulty with autism and ASD being used over such a broad category of people um, with many different functioning needs. For example, a parent with a non-verbal autistic child who requires 24-hour support um, may feel it isn't appropriate to use the same diagnosis to describe their child um, as someone who um, maybe works and requires minimal support. It's important to note that ASD is wide ranging and functioning levels may vary at different times, even in the same individual. And, and every autistic person has their own strengths and weaknesses. Um, so in the UK and across many different countries, we use the DSM to diagnose um, mental illnesses. Um, it also has a definition of autism. The language has changed a lot from the DSM-4 to the DSM-5 and some people still identify with the previous categorizations. Um, in the DSM-4, disorders including autistic disorder, Asperger's syndrome, childhood disintegrative disorder, pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified, were categorized under pervasive developmental disorders. Um, so one of these is Asperger's syndrome, which people have probably heard quite a lot about, and this was previously used to describe, quote, high functioning autistics, um, and was coined by a doctor collaborating with the Nazis. His original diagnosis was called autistic psychopathy. He practiced eugenics in deciding which autistic children he deemed productive enough to avoid being euthanized. This term was removed from the DSM-5 in 2013 and should only be used as self-identification. Currently, the DSM-5 splits ASD into three levels based on the amount of support required, um, along with the different things that may be expected of someone at this level. This is disputed widely due to um, varying neuro behaviours, making it difficult to fit people into these levels consistently. Um, and we should really consider what the problems might be with categorising ASD into functioning levels based on support needs. Um, so people in the autistic community um, tend to perceive autism more like this image um, as a, uh, a spectrum. Um, so instead of being at one point on a line, there's many different aspects to autism. And it's a much more three dimensional concept. Um, we no longer use functioning labels as an autistic community. Instead of being quote, high functioning, quote, low functioning, um, these levels may vary um, and contain many different components. Um, they might vary with time and circumstances and different stress levels. I know for me that my functioning is very much based on um, the situation that I'm in. Um, some people also feel that functioning levels invalidate the struggles of those deemed high functioning um, and underestimate the abilities of those deemed low functioning. Um, and just because autism is a spectrum doesn't mean that everybody is a little autistic. I hear this one a lot. Um, many people have traits related to autism and everyone will have different emotional regulation, sensory processing and executive functioning. Um, but many people will not meet the diagnostic threshold. But equally, professional diagnosis is um, very difficult to access. And so we should consider this um, in who can um, self-diagnose themselves as autistic. So on to women with autism. Um, so it's a long held myth that only the majority of autistic people are male. This is due to diagnostic criteria and the fact that often autistic women will present differently. Um, we as women usually have a greater capacity for traditional friendships and are more vulnerable to internalising problems and having increased levels of anxiety, depression and eating disorders. Furthermore, many autistic women and girls learn to mask and adapt and therefore high levels of women are undiagnosed or diagnosed later in life than men, as was said in one of the comments. 
Um, many women who are misdiagnosed um, or are initially diagnosed with a mental health disorder prior to receiving an ASD diagnosis. This is frequently seen with misdiagnosis of personality disorders due to overlapping symptoms. For example, emotional dysregulation and um, being mistaken for emotionally unstable personality disorder. Um, up to 60% of autistic adults are diagnosed with at least one personality disorder which really shows the massive problem with misdiagnosis. Uh, the ratio of diagnosis between the sexes is narrowing and you will therefore probably meet many, many autistic people um, in your career as a midwife. As we said, it can be really difficult to access um, a diagnosis and therefore we should really consider in um, maternity services, how we can um, ensure that there is a pathway for diagnosis um, and um, sure that's available to people. So there is a lot of comorbidities that are associated with autism. This is not to say that these conditions are caused by autism or vice versa. Um, but just that links have been noted. Um, some conditions such as anxiety and eating disorders appear to be much more prevalent in autistic women as opposed to autistic men. Um, so epilepsy, whilst 1% of the general population is affected by epilepsy, this rises so much to up to 46% in the autistic population. Um, we should note that some subclinical seizures are difficult to identify in autistic people due to common behavioural traits. Um, and if someone with epilepsy is wishing to be pregnant, we should always consider medication review. So anxiety is also extremely prevalent in people with ASD, and this often worsens into adolescence um, when people are more aware of the um, difficulties that they have um, relating to social situations. This is also related to poor stress management and emotional regulation and up to 84% of autistic youth suffer some degree of anxiety, so the large majority. Um, depression occurs in more than half of the autistic population um, and this can be really difficult to identify or diagnose due to alexithemia, which means difficulty identifying emotions. So when screening for depression in autistic adults, as we um, in England anyway do it, all contacts in maternity services, we should pay attention to other signs such as sleep problems, apathy, um, eating, as well as the self-reporting. 66% of adults with autism or presenting to diagnostic clinics admitted to suicidal ideation and 35% to previous plans or attempts. Um, there are higher rates of ASD amongst eating disorder populations as opposed to those without eating disorders. Autistic people may be less responsive to traditional treatments and ASD should be considered in recovery plans. Um, there's an up to 30% co-occurrence of ASD and OCD, so obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, however, symptoms may overlap, such as rituals. Uh, the difference is OCD rituals are likely to be egotistonic, which means they are unwanted or illogical, um, whilst autistic rituals are often purposeful and bring pleasure. Um, when considering all of these high prevalence of mental disorders in autistic people, we should also be thinking about um, how we can react to that in maternity services. So offering referral to perinatal mental health services, for example. Um, up to 85% uh, and anecdotally more um, autistic people experience gastrointestinal issues um, or GI problems. The link between GI symptoms and ASD is widely noted but it is unknown if autism has any role to play in this, either biologically or due to additional factors such as eating habits. Um, sleep disorders, uh, studies have shown that statistically significant differences in levels of sleep problems between autistic and non-autistic adults and children. With all of these, as healthcare professionals, we need to be aware of comorbidities and how to treat these in a way that also considers the holistic needs of autistic individuals, noticing that they may respond to treatments, particularly psychological treatments, um, differently to neurotypical people.
So autism in the perinatal period. As we all know, pregnancy is a time of great change within a person's body, including their emotions. And we should remember this, and this will be even more heightened for autistic people um, due to the sensory processing. They might be hypersensitive or hyposensitive. Um, and minor disorders of pregnancy, such as nausea, will be much more difficult to deal with and firm accommodations may need to be made in regards to their care. Although the research of autism in pregnancy is limited, um, there are many more studies coming out and these have shown that autistic women and birthing people have been shown to have increased intervention and poorer outcomes, including iatrogenic preterm birth, elective cesarean section, and preeclampsia. So it's really important that we identify autism in pregnancy and consider um, why this is happening. Autistic women often have greater healthcare challenges, including healthcare anxiety, communication, and emotional distress, environmental anxiety. A study showed 75% of participants didn't disclose their autism with healthcare professionals due to them being uninformed, which shows that we really need to educate ourselves on autism and um, be a safe place for people to disclose their diagnosis. Due to healthcare barriers, the average living age is much lower for autistic individuals. With better training and awareness, we can make disclosing ASD more comfortable for those entering maternity services. It's important to consider when women can disclose autism. Um, whilst booking questions in the UK um, include mental health and learning disabilities, ASD doesn't fit neatly into either of these. Um, and if these problems are present, it's usually caused by ASD rather than vice versa. Um, we should consider having a um, question about neurodivergency in the booking questionnaire so it is much easier for autistic people to disclose their diagnosis. Um, alongside this, autistic women and birthing people are more likely to experience postnatal depression and have increased isolation in parenthood despite finding it rewarding. Um, so I really wanted to include um, breastfeeding as an autistic mother, um, as this is widely um, spoke about in the autistic community as mothers. Um, as I said, uh, lots of autistic people have sensory processing um, problems. They might um, go into sensory overload when there is a lot of noise or uh, touch that they don't like, things like that. Um, so a study that spoke to autistic breastfeeding mothers um, found a common theme of quote overstimulation during breastfeeding. Um, and this was from the sounds of infants suckling to the sensations caused by letdown reflexes and sucking with emphasis, be emphasis being placed on sensory overload from touch. Um, ways suggested to mitigate this distress um, from this narrative included eliminating other sensory stimuli such as sitting in a darkened room, um, and wearing nipple shields to act as a barrier um, between the touch of mother and baby. Alongside these struggles, autistic women also reported hyperfixation as an asset to breastfeeding, meaning they were engrossed in learning about it. Although autism can include uh, many difficulties, which I talk about a lot today, it's important to note that autism brings a lot of strength. Um, and this is really seen with um, autistic mothers who are choosing to breastfeed. Um, we should consider if adaptations to learning and support is necessary, adapting learning to an individual's needs using visual diagrams and use of models such as a knitted doll and breast, particularly showing inner anatomy may be beneficial to autistic people. Um, some autistic people will not receive as much benefit from group-based breastfeeding support, so consider if individual support can help more. Um, remember that all autistic people are individual and require to be treated as such. Different difficulties will arise for each different person and we should consider how we can promote breastfeeding whilst recognising it is not suited to the individual needs of all autistic people. So I've now got a few slides on um, suggestions of how we can better support autistic women in maternity services. Many of these things um, that I suggest will be the best care that we should be giving to all women and birthing people. Um, but I'm highlighting that these are especially important to focus on um, when working with autistic individuals. So my 
biggest thing that I always say if people ask me um, is continuity of carer. I think this should be an absolute priority for people with additional care needs such as autistic women as we are increasingly seeing positive impacts with continuity models and I firmly believe this could revolutionise care for autistic birthing people. Um, it would ease communication and help the difficulty and change that autistic people often experience. We should ensure there is someone who can advocate for autistic people entering maternity services where they cannot do this for themselves. Uh, this could be a family member, a friend, a health or social care professional or a doula. Um, wherever possible, we should accommodate these needs and allow this person to be present and ensure ease of visitation if admitted to hospital. Um, we need to remember that every autistic person is different, as I keep saying, um, and try to find out what makes things more manageable for them. Find out how they might present when they experience sensory overload or a meltdown and how to overcome this. We should think about what are common triggers for them and how we can overcome them. This is another reason why continuity of care is so valuable in ensuring you're aware of the individual and unique needs of your autistic clients. Change and unpredictability are also often more difficult for autistic people um, and we should think about how we can make this easier. So examples of this are education on potentially potential scenarios, so how a woman's body might change through pregnancy, symptoms to expect, um, understanding the lack of certainty in a due date, educating on stages of labour, um, including potential complications and explaining the format of appointments to be expected and um, what healthcare professionals they may meet during their pregnancy. Um, we should also allow tours of the birthing environment if this isn't at home to allow um, them to get more um, familiar with it uh, and maybe use visual cues and adaptations to learning. Sensory processing is a key aspect of autism, as I've discussed, and hypersensitivity is common or difficulty in processing senses. Um, we should adapt to, um, to these needs, and this could be allowing a quiet side room or their own music to be played. Um, it might be accommodating various tactile sensory needs, such as fidget toys, weighted blankets or lap pads. Also important to note is differing pain perception as an extension of sensory sensitivity. Um, we need to involve autistic people in research. We shouldn't let the barriers such as communication difficulties eliminate autistic people from research into maternity and neonatal services. Um, uh, we should consider alternative forms of communication um, through the input of non-speaking -autist uh, non autistic people and encourage more research into autism in the perinatal period. As I said, we need clear diagnostic pathways for women and a different diagnostic tool potentially to be used. Um, this includes diagnostic pathways in maternity services, as nowadays most people would not have the slightest idea of how to refer someone for an autism diagnosis um, from maternity. But this is one of the times when um, a woman is most likely to be in con prolonged contact with healthcare professionals. Um, as always, informed consent and education are vital and some autistic people might want everything explained fully with rationale. I know that's definitely me. Um, whilst others, particularly those with additional learning disabilities, might need this information adapted. We should make use of resources and signposting using leaflets, posters, websites, videos and charities, which might all be really beneficial for autistic people. This might also include technology, um, so apps, videos, online classes, which might be more accessible to autistic people. Um, we should try and keep consistent appointment times and location um, and consider if home visits might be more appropriate um, for the autistic person. You should consider forming action plans, for example, what to do if they have a meltdown. Personally, I find flashcards and different coping skills that I can give to people if I'm struggling and um, the best way to easily communicate my needs. Uh, place of birth discussions, so how can you make birth as stress-free as possible? Think about minimal amounts of unwanted sensory stimuli that we can control. 
Uh, some autistic women may prefer elective cesarean section due to the unpredictability of labour and birth. However, as always, these should be individualised discussions. Um, as outlined in the previous slide, sensory issues and cognitive functioning may mean extra support is required for breastfeeding and increased education um, and breastfeeding support should be individualised for ASD. Formula feeding can often seem more desirable to people with ASD due to the routine of it and the measurements, um, so we should consider how we can consider this and still promote breastfeeding. Um, so autistic women may interact differently with their child or um, require additional cues in reacting to their children. There's nothing good or bad, bad about this and we should really uh, delay our judgment on any of these things. We should consider antenatal um, education. Are group classes accessible? Would individual support sessions be better? Or could someone accompany the woman to antenatal classes to help them integrate better into the social environment? Birth planning or birth wishes may be very important for an autistic person. We should discuss these and allow them to be creative in a way that works visually for them and ensure that all health care professionals that are involved in the person's care are aware of these needs. Um, if you're required to go to theatre for either an emergency or elective um, procedure, you should consider sensory input. So as Anyone who's been in a theatre knows there's a lot of bright lights, there's people moving anywhere, there's a lot of talk and there's machines beeping um, and this can really cause sensory overload. So how can we mitigate this or allow for coping mechanisms um, in theatre? We should make sure that adequate mental health support is available, um, consider referrals to perinatal mental health teams and coordinate with any existing professionals involved in the women's care. Um, I also think birth reflection is really important. Um, this is a debrief of the birth experience and this should be beneficial to um, any autistic woman, whether the birth was perceived as traumatic or not, to allow them to understand everything that happened and the different sensory experiences it entailed. The most quick perfect birth um, might feel traumatic when you experience emotions and senses so acutely. We should ensure there is always a lot of time to explain any procedures, questions and offer reassurances when um, we see our autistic clients. We should always remember that autism is a hidden disability and we should never make judgments or assumptions of whether someone is autistic based on how they look or act. Um, if disclosed and consent is given, we should make sure that everyone working with the woman is aware of the diagnosis and its potential implications if there are any. So I'm going to end with this quote, it's from a book called From Here to Maternity um, by Lara Grant. It says, or awareness of autism is vital for everyone. Until we have that awareness of difference and offer individualised care, women such as me will still have difficult experiences. And here are a lot of references and some further reading. Thank you. Fantastic, Sophie. Thank you so much. There's a lot of interest there on the presentation in the comments. Everybody's saying how fantastic you are presenting for one and also how how really um, interesting all the information is um, and how people can be using that in practice. Um, Sophie is I'm happy to take um, questions, um, live questions. If anybody has any live questions, then um, she's happy to talk um, to you. And if you want to post any questions in the chat box as well, I'm happy to present those to Sophie. We'll just use this time, see if... Um... Okay, so Bromley wants to know which study are you quoting when you mention an autistic person may prefer a section? Uh, that's not from a study, it's anecdotal evidence that some people have said. Um, Lara Grant mentions it in her book um, as well as um, there's a study that I did quote um, relating to um, elective caesareans being more prevalent um, in autistic mothers. So just sometimes um, a mother's uh, preference, yeah. 
Um, and you might say you might be seeing that in women that don't have a diagnosis of autism as well. Would that be right, Sophie? Yeah, potentially. Um, obviously, no one really knows what will happen in labour. Um, and I know I've had anecdotal evidence of um, the uncertainty around a due date being quite distressing for autistic people who um, we often like um, routine and knowing what's going to happen. Um, so some people prefer that, but equally many people won't. That's really interesting. Looking at the research and the references that you've got, if you go onto those slides, are you able to um, give us an overview of any um, particular research that we should really seek out if we want to and know what's the most up-to-date evidence-based practice that's um, going on? Most, well, most of the ones that are recent, um, anything about autism and pregnancy is pretty up to date research because it's only recently um, been explored, even since Ryan's presentation, so many more studies have come out. Um, so I think it's just important to stay on top of all of that. Um, obviously, these references include things that are widely around the subject of autism rather than being particular to pregnancy. Um, and, and if um, anybody uh, would want a list of the references, it would be okay for them to send you an email to ask for that, would it, Sophie? That's absolutely fine, yeah. Fantastic. If we just use this time that we've got, if we just um, go back and just um, talk to us a little bit more about what you would consider to be the most important things that a midwife would need to know about supporting a woman in birth. Um, so during birth, we should consider the different sensory sensitivities that people have. Um, so as well as ensuring we um, eliminate unwanted sensory stimuli. Um, we should also um, think about how they might perceive pain, if they perceive pain more strongly or um, are less aware of pain and um, feelings going on in their body. Um, as I say, I think that continuity of care will be really amazing for this as we can understand how the person presents when they're stressed, for example, um, shutdowns and meltdowns um, and how we can adapt to that. Um, we should probably consider how communication can still be allowed even when um, there are, I will just move that, sorry, um, even when there is a shutdown and the autistic person um, can't communicate through words. That's, that's great, Sophie, that's really, really helpful. Just check to see if there's a... Oh, God, we see that. Yeah, no, that's fine. And then can you talk to us a little bit more about, particularly about communication um, when you're um, supporting an autistic woman? Um, can you talk to us a little bit more about what you would do to really individualise her care plan? So it's all about getting to know that person. We've probably all heard um, the like stereotype that autistic people don't like eye contact. Um, that's sometimes the case. So don't force these things. Um, allow them to communicate in a way that is um, comfortable for them. So if they're not offering eye contact, it might not be a sign that they're not interested, but probably more of a sign that they take information in better if they aren't um, doing so. Um, which consider like different means of communication, some use alternative, um, so uh, technology based communication, um, writing things down, giving information in a wide variety, so maybe giving education verbally and then also giving them leaflets and um, written information. Excellent, that's fantastic, Sophie. Just see, um, very good, long presentation. So, yeah, Linda's just saying that the slides will be available along with the presentation. Is there anybody else that, that has any more questions for Sophie at all? Just give it a couple of minutes. You can either um, talk to us or you can put, post, the, post the questions in the chat there. I can see Ella's typing, so I'll just see if there's a final question comes up. 
couple of people type it so I'll just see what comes up there Sophie before I go on to the final slides yeah that's fine um, I'm at the University of Leicester um, I don't know about other courses because um, obviously we also have a paired with a um, nursing course which has mental health so I assume they get more education. I personally delivered the education on um, autism in the perinatal period to my cohort um, and they're really keen on working with me to get um, a serve, like not a service user but um, the voice of an autistic person in speaking part of the, um, the cohort. Great. So, can you suggest anything in particular apart from the brilliant things you've already mentioned about how to support or prepare an autistic partner during birth? That's a great question, Sarah. Thank you. Yeah, I've genuinely never thought about that, so I think that's really interesting. Um, I think this is where COVID's probably really struggled as well because we don't always see the partners. Um, when you have that holistic and um, like relational care, you can get to know them and um, be able to offer any education. Um, maybe, I doubt we even know how many of the partners are autistic because we don't ask that many questions about um, partners um, so it'd be interesting to think about that and how we can adapt needs um, allow time for them to walk away if they might need to during the birth process uh, things like that that's great thank you okay ah um have you written a journal um on this subject sophie psm or dpm uh, that's in midwife yeah. I'm working in collaboration with um, another autistic lecturer and another autistic student midwife um, on some pieces which we hope will come out in the future. Um, yeah. Keep an yeah, eye out. That's great. Thank you, Katie, for that question. Fantastic to hear. Yes, absolutely. I do okay. have some things on it anyway. Okay. Um, okay. I Oh, Ella's typing in. I'll just see if there's any more questions. Ah, which journal? The perhaps the midwife, you say, Sophie? Uh, yeah, we hope the first one will be in the perhaps in midwife. Yeah, the perhaps in midwife. Okay, I think I'll close down the questions now. And then um, if you need to contact Sophie, her email address, um, we can, um, I'll put that in the chat box for you again um, and I'll just go through to the next slides. <laughs>